am going to talk to you about um, the cotton industry, the Australian cotton industry. So I'm an agriculture agri sustainability consultant. One of my clients is the Australian cotton industry. And we're talking about drivers and opportunities for the industry as a whole, but also what's in it for, for growers. Um, and what's in it for growers is exactly what's in, in it in terms of sustainability for any industry or any company that takes sustainability seriously. And that's better management of risk and opportunity, better productivity, and increased market access, increased or retained market access. And that's why the cotton industry manages sustainability. That's why any industry or company manages sustainability. And those are the value drivers for any farmer or farm business that wants to take sustainability seriously as well. So Cotton 101, um, I know many of you in the room will be very familiar, but um, um, as you know, it's a, it's a summer crop. Uh, almost all of the crop is, um, is, is used when it's processed, either as compost or as um, cotton seed oil or stock feed. And about 40% by volume or about 85% by, belt, by value of the, uh, the cotton plant is, is the white fluffy stuff that's linked, which goes to make um, shirts like, like this. Um, it's not a massive industry, but it's really important in the, in the regions where it's grown, in the areas where it's grown. So there's about 1,500 farms uh, that grow cotton in Australia, or up to about 1,500, but varies depending on the seed. Um, the average for the last few years, last five, six years, has been about $2 billion. The last couple of years have been $5 billion crops. So again, varies depending on the, um, on the amount grown. Um, and it's a really important contributor to those regions because about 80% um, of, of, the, of, the, of the revenue from farms is, is spent locally in local businesses. And because cotton tends to have a higher gross uh, return on margins than, um, than other farm business enterprises, it's really important for providing resilience to, to a whole farm business, whole farm enterprise. Um, I can't really talk about cotton in Australia without talking about water. Um, so in Australia, um, water is regulated by state governments, as you know, and the basic needs of the environment and people have to be met before any water can be made available for other industries like irrigation. So any farmer that has allocated uh, water, wherever they are in Australia, will then choose what to do with that water that they are allocated and obviously it varies depending on the season. Um, every farmer I know tries to use any water they are given, however small or, or large that volume is, they try to use it in the crop that gives them the best economic return and I try to use it as efficiently as possible. And you can see here from this, um, apologies, I know some of you in the back room maybe can't see it, but the, you know, the green trend line here is the area of uh, average area of cotton planted in Australia. And you can see it's hardly grown, it's hardly increased. It's about a good same amount of cotton as has been grown over the past 30 years so on average. But the orange dotted line, the amount of bales picked from that roughly same area has increased by about 80% in 30 years. So cotton growers uh, are certainly becoming more efficient um, with growing water on, with growing cotton on, with available water and land. And that's really important because, you know, everything we do in sustainability is aligned to the Sustainable Development Goals, which the U.S. has. Uh, there's 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Everyone, everyone then has a number of targets. And for water, the relevant target for us is to significantly increase water use efficiency within sustainable water withdrawals. So um, the fact that water is heavily regulated uh, to ensure sustainable withdrawals, that cotton farmers choose what to grow uh, when the water is available, and that they significantly improve their um, their efficiency, is directly aligned to that uh, United Nations SDG target. Um, the cotton sustainability framework. This is how we manage sustainability uh, at a at a whole industry level. Um, and as you know, you've, you've already heard from from other from other frameworks. So every year we produce a, a concise update of, of what we're doing, the sustainability report. Um, and there's, there's, there's a link to that on, the, on our website. We also provide an Excel database that has more detail. Um, it has the data sources, links to the data sources, the methods, the assumptions, additional notes for people wanting more detail. Really, really important that we're as transparent as we possibly can be. But at the same time, we try and communicate really well. So we try and keep that written report very concise and then there's more detail if you want it. So we have been through a process, which I'll explain on the next slide, to identify the most important social and economic and environmental topics for the industry as a whole. Uh, we've aligned everything we do to the sustainable development goals um, on the logic that if we're doing our part as a cotton industry to contribute to those goals, then uh, we're, we're, we're helping that, that global effort to get to what people have decided is, is a sustainable planet, if you like, in terms of environmental and social and, and economic stuff. Um, every year, as I said, we do a concise report and we're very transparent in terms of what happened year on year 
um, and over five years, and when we have done it, we go longer as well. Um, if things don't go according to plan, but they don't go in the right direction, we, we, you know, we, we won't try and hide it. We can say what happened and why. Um, often in a farming system, it's from uh, factors outside of the, the control of individual farmers. Uh, it could be seasonal, it could be market, who knows. Uh, if it's if it's things that we can see we need to to improve, the industry needs to improve, then, then we spell out what, what we're trying to do to address that. So transparency is really important. Um, I'll just make a note here. I know this uh, this session is called uh, or conference is called ESG. What's in it for me? I know that that's that's rhymes and it's it's really good. I'll make I, I really keen for you though to eliminate ESG from, from your vocabulary. And I'll tell you why. Um, this is a definition from something called the accountability AA 1000 principles, which for me is the best of the multiple, multiple standards and frameworks that are out there to manage and measure sustainability. Um, and this speaks about improving performance while creating social, economic, and environmental value. Now ESG, environmental, social, and governance, specifically excludes economic value. Um, and that's or economic, the economic impact that the individual farms or whole industries have to their economy. So the money you pay in wages, the money you pay in rates and taxes, the contribution you make to local um, organisations, the procurement, the stuff you buy, the services in which you can buy locally, none of that is excluded under a, uh, a, a, and it's already explicitly excluded from an ESG framework. That's important because we know from research, um, whole and agriculture research, that by far the biggest driver of community trust and acceptance of agriculture in Australia is environmental responsibility. And by far the second biggest driver of trust and acceptance is perceived contribution and value to Australia. So if you're talking about ESG, you're not talking about economic contribution, and you frankly, you're missing out on one of the most, most important drivers of trust as a farmer or as an industry. So sustainability, not ESG. Really important you know that um, sustainability is a strategic process. It's not some hippie like me um, just dreaming up nice things to do. It's a methodical process. Again, this comes from the AA1000 uh, 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 standard with four key steps. First looking to identify who are your stakeholders, who are the people who you impact or who impact you in the course of your business or your industry. So that's people like employees, but also customers and uh, activists and governments and, and um, community groups and others. You know, none of us operate in, a, in, a, in an island. We are all impacted by or impact on other people. And if you take into account uh, what's important to those people, you more likely can be aware of risks and opportunities that are facing you. You can't manage everything though, you can't keep everyone happy. So then the second step is materiality, so prioritising what's most important, then responding to the most important things, to manage them appropriately, then measuring impact and progress, and then going back and telling your stakeholders what you're doing and how you're going for all feedback. So that's what we do with the Cotton Sustainability Framework, that's what Beef and all the other sustainability frameworks do, but also individual companies do as well who manage sustainability well. And to me the logic there, this is my definition, not anyone else's, but um, you're more likely to be successful if you know and manage what impacts your success. So strategic planning typically is done around the kitchen table or a farm or around a boardroom um, in, a, in a company. Sustainability is the same thing, but it takes you outside the kitchen table, outside the boardroom and says what's important to the people that we rely on to operate as an industry or as a business. And if we know that and we prioritise it, we manage it, we're more likely to be successful. The business case for anyone doing sustainability, as I highlighted up front, is, is consistently threefold. Because you're more aware of what's important to the people who you rely on, and you're more aware of environmental and social and economic conditions, you're more aware of risk and opportunities to manage. Uh, you can increase productivity, both from doing more with less, but also from things like um, uh, uh, you know, having, having less, less injuries, for example, or being more aware of, um, of trying to do things differently there's a lot of literature that says that that, that creates uh, an innovation dividend in workforces, you know, that puts a sustainability culture. So increased productivity. And thirdly, most importantly, or even becoming more important probably, is market access and growth. So like it or not, um, customers of Australian food and fibre um, are increasingly looking for evidence of sustainable industries. Not just food and fibre companies, but all companies around the world. I won't bore you with this too much, but, you know, in terms of when customers... Uh, our customers or financial institutions or anyone else decide how to measure and how to manage sustainability. Um, initially, there was something called the Global Reporting Initiative, which said this is what you should be measuring and this is how you should be measuring it. Since about, and that was in 1997, it was established. In the last sort of two decades or 15 years, there's been an explosion of just a ridiculous number of competing and conflicting and 
inconsistent by looks. I won't bore you with this other than to, to show you that all of this is, is trying to be juggled by the customers, the buy Australian food and fibre, the financial institutions that lend money to, to farm businesses or that invest in farm uh, agribusiness. Um, and there's a huge amount of pressure uh, coming on all these standards for those customers or those financial institutions to provide sustainability data. So if we don't provide it, then there's increasing risk of being locked out of markets. As one example only, just to drill down specifically, looking at biodiversity, or as, as we regard it in the, or as, as we see further to the industry, native vegetation. Um, some of those frameworks I showed you on the um, uh, previous slide, the ones that are most commonly used by customers of food and fiber have in the past couple of years started to be very explicit in asking for um, companies or organizations that follow those frameworks to, to look for zero deforestation um, targets or set zero, zero deforestation targets from 2020. Now, not all these companies will follow these or start to these frameworks. The ones that do may not enforce them rigorously. We know, we know that some companies are already struggling to, to, to manage and to report carbon, greenhouse gas emissions, um, let alone biodiversity native vegetation. It's just so hard to do it. But um, we ignore this at our peril. Um, this is coming um, to us. Customers and financial institutions are being asked to provide this sort of stuff. Um, so it's a risk that if we don't provide it, this sort of data, or if we ignore it, then we risk losing those markets. Initially, it will be those premium sort of customers that, that put a lot of time and effort into this. But in time, uh, over time, there's an increasing risk of an increasing number of markets that we risk being locked out of. This is just one example, but sustainability as a whole. Of course, the flip side to, to risk is opportunity. Um, and the opportunity here is that, as I said, customers in financial institutions are really struggling, really struggling with how to cost effectively and robustly measure things like biodiversity, but also greenhouse gases and social aspects of sustainability across global complicated supply chains. So the opportunity for us as an industry, for industries, is to try and shape a solution that makes sense for Australian agriculture, but also meets the needs of our customers around the world. So I talked about a couple of the ways that we're doing that. Starting with native vegetation. Um, so as I, as I spoke about, um, uh, native vegetation is one of our uh, our priority topics um, in our sustainability framework in cotton. Um, and it's, 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 it's material, it's important because of the previous slide, that customers are increasingly looking for evidence of, of the extent of, of deforestation and sometimes even uh, or afforestation and, uh, and, and will in future increasingly looking for, for the zero deforestation commitments as well. Um, we haven't in the past tried to measure native vegetation, or we're not try, I'm trying to do it accurately, because there's no consistent way of measuring native vegetation extent and condition and connectivity at scale. And we didn't want to go down the path of, of, of trying to do our own thing, and then finding that you know, beef or sheep or grains or other frameworks have done, have done, or governments have done a different way of measuring it in the, in the future. So we're waiting for national consistency before we did anything. The problem we have is our customers aren't waiting. They're wanting to see um, uh, this sort of information. And as I said, we're treating it as an opportunity to say, well, here's what makes sense in the Australian context. And what makes sense to us is thinking first that native vegetation and biodiversity varies by region. So it doesn't make sense trying to have a one size fits all approach for the entire country, let alone the entire world. Um, if you're thinking regional variation and regional management, then to us, the logical entities to partner with are the NRM um, bodies in Australia. So there are seven of those where cotton is traditionally grown, including Murray LLS, obviously. And we've been working with them for the past two and a half years to firstly say, can we identify or develop regionally specific native vegetation targets that are directly aligned to the priorities you've identified in each of your regions and each, each of your strategic plans in terms of uh, priorities for um, restoration or protection or whatever it, whatever it is. We then worked with each of those seven organisations to develop consistent indicators to measure extended connectivity. Now, even across these seven NRMs um, where cotton is grown, it's inconsistent ways to measure um, native veg. And again, we've got this problem of um, uh, you know trying to be consistent with our other commodity frameworks, but also trying to be consistent with what our customers are using. So, rather than just pick an indicator that say you know Murray LLS, we like you guys, you're really nice. Let's use what you're measuring, or the indicators that you're using. We've gone back to the frameworks we think our customers are most likely to use, and we've used the indicators that are within them, and gone back to the to the NRMs and said, "Hey guys, let's use these. We've got to agree on that." So we've got consistent indicators. We've got reasonably appropriate targets, 
the final piece of the puzzle is still very much a concept, but it's something we want to work, we're working on. Um, we know from industry research in cotton that a major um, barrier to action by farmers is that there's just too much noise out there. There's too much confusion when it comes to biodiversity in terms of what to do. So we would like to have a network of regional hubs. Um, I really don't care if that's the NRM region or the LLS or if it's a council or the uh, land care or the drought hub, whatever. I'm organisation agnostic, but it makes a lot of sense to us to have a one-stop shop for any farmer anywhere in Australia to say, well, if I want to do something on my farm in terms of native vegetation, I'll go to this one place, they'll look at the map and tell me exactly what I need to do to most contribute to regional outcomes. I'll also be comforted, be, have the knowledge that um, all my neighbours and, and, and others in the region are having similar advice that there's coordinated regional action towards a common goal and all the governments and companies and industries that are trying that are providing you know um, financial support or grants or, or market payments or, or volunteers they can all funnel them into regional hubs that then get distributed out to farmers so a real one-stop shop so this is a big ambitious piece of work but it's something we're doing with the with the LLSs and the NRMs in Queensland and we're cement making some really good progress on that um, currently finalizing consultation with the cotton growers and hope to um to really finalise it in the next sort of six months or so. The opportunity with this is that if we can make this work for native vegetation in cotton growing regions, then we can extend the same regionally uh, specific approach and, and coordinated um, uh, allocation of resources across other sources of natural capital, you know, soil, water, but also social capital as well. So much more coordinated and collaborative delivery of um, resources. And if we can make this work for, for natural and social capital in cotton, then we can make it work for natural and social capital in all the other industries in Australia as well. And I spent a lot of time talking to my peers in the um, other industry frameworks to, to, to know what we're doing and, and hear what they're doing and, and to try and work to, together towards some consistency across this. Um, another thing we're doing is promoting soil. So like um, native vegetation, soil health is something that there's no nationally consistent way to measure. We've been waiting for those indicators to come out. And the National Soil Health Strategy, which is a really important piece of work being driven uh, by Canberra, is working on that. Uh, that'll take a little while to finish those. So in the meantime, we're really encouraging cotton growers, but also any other farmers, um, just to go back to first principles. Um, we know soil is alive, so like any, any living thing, soil needs uh, food and shelter. And if you're a farmer, rather than be prescriptive or telling you must do this, with regard to your own environmental and geological and farm business situations, just choose practices that give your soil food and shelter that make sense for you. If you do that, then the soil properties that, um, that we rely on will take care of themselves to an extent and the soil functions, so crop production or uh, resilience and other things that we rely on as well, will almost take care of themselves as well. So we'll get indicators and data and ways to measure properties and functions at a consistent national scale in the next little while. Until then, we're encouraging farms just to give their soil food and shelter. So it's a really big picture stuff with native vegetation. It's a much simpler stuff if you like for soil. And finally, just bringing all that together, um, we're doing a lot of work right now in the industry on revamping and reorganising our sustainability data. So we have our sustainability topics, you know, economic, social, environmental stuff that we've spoken about before that, that are most important to us. And we've always had a sort of a grab bag of indicators. So whether that's the Global Reporting Initiative, whether that's Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, there's multiple of those sort of frameworks on a previous slide that I showed you, but we've sort of got a kind of got an indicator here, indicator there, and, and it's sort of you know, it's, it's done its job. But it's fairly arbitrary. And when you want to get away from arbitrary, we want to be much more um, uh, logical and just 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 clear um, in what we're doing to try and cut through some of this cluttering complexity around sustainability. So we've um, chosen the two or three of those frameworks which I showed you on a, on the earlier slide that we think customers of food and fibre are most likely to use in the future. And those frameworks talk about, uh, or they provide, indicators for condition, so quality, if you like, of soil, water, and native veg, but they also have indicators for impacts and dependencies. So what are the practices that impact soil, water, and native veg? What do you depend on soil, water, and native veg for? You know? And the logic of doing that is that if we can make this work, if we have a, a sustainability database that's aligned to the needs of our customers, customers sitting in Melbourne or Mumbai or, um, or Montreal who are trying to manage complex global supply chains with multiple commodities at a time poor and often don't know much at all about agricultural environment, when they're being told, hey, here's 800 pages of a new task force for nature-related financial disclosures that you need to do, they're throwing up their hands and saying, we just don't know how to do that. Our hope is that 
if we can say, here is the data you need to meet those needs, it just makes it much easier than to buy Australian. We're also using the exact same data, so the single source of data, to try and put a value on some of these um, natural and social capital. We're working with the Queensland government to do that um, and looking to do other things as well. So the intention is a single database, a single source of data can be used for multiple purposes. We're also sharing this very uh, freely and very transparently with the other agricultural sustainability frameworks and anyone else involved in agriculture really, uh, in the hope that people can look over our shoulder, see what we're doing, to, 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 to improve how we organise sustainability indicators, look at what we're doing to, to, to value natural and social capital, look at what we're doing to do the other stuff, and hopefully can be uh, consistent with what we're doing or tell us what we should do differently so we can be consistent with them and we get towards a much more collaborative and, um, and a consistent and non-duplicative approach. So that's a really big, big piece of work that we're doing. What does that mean for you, the farmers? Well, a few things. One is that you can use uh, the same indicators which we're using to measure your own on-farm sustainability. Um, and again, because we're sharing widely and we're being very transparent, we're hopeful that um, any other agricultural industry, eventually within the next year or so, we work towards any agricultural industry looking to use the same indicators, or banks, or anyone else, you know, and, and we contribute a lot to the Australian Agricultural Sustainability Framework to that as well. So a common set of indicators to measure sustainability on-farm is, is one output. More importantly, are those three belly drivers I spoke about earlier on. Um, by being able to measure um, your impacts and, and change the unity on these things, then you can look to see what are the practices that drive productivity. By being more aware of you know, these, these big topics that are important for the cotton industry if you grow cotton, or the grains framework if you go grain, or the beef framework if you have beef, you're more aware of the risks and opportunities now and in the future so you can plan your business accordingly. And finally, the third driver was market access, and yes, 100%. If you are providing these things, then you will certainly uh, increase the risk, uh, increase, increase, increase the, uh, the, the probability that you, that you retain markets. I've got premiums there because almost every farmer I speak to asks, well, what's the premiums for this? What do we get paid for this? And the answer is that premiums are a function of branding and marketing. Um, that's a really complicated skill in itself. It's a very expensive skill and it's a non-stop thing that you have to keep turning on the tap to, to, to get to justify that, that, that marketing and branding. So if you get a premium, it's the icing on the cake. But if you're identifying what's important to you, managing it and then measuring the impact it has on your business or contributing to um, industry as a whole, then the real value comes from maintaining markets from better risk and opportunity and from better productivity. Um, that's it, so I'll finish there. So thanks very much for having me and um, back to you guys.